The Lord be with you. And also with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 21st chapter of Jesus' revelation to John. Revelation chapter 21, we read, we'll be reading verses 1 through 6 there this morning. Follow along on the screen if you'd like. Revelation chapter 21, beginning there with verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, help us to have ears to hear. Ears to hear your words, not whatever words I put in the way. Give us, Lord, eyes to see, to see the way forward you have for us. And Lord, hearts open to receive whatever it is you have for us this morning, that we may take it to ourselves and be changed more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, as we've recognized our graduates, I'm mindful of a few friends uh, who have also celebrated recent graduate graduations, fellow doctoral students who've gotten a semester or two ahead of the rest of us and have received their hoods and diplomas already. One of those is a friend of mine named Will. Will started the program at McAfee about a year before me, and we became fast friends. Will is the pastor at First Baptist Augusta. Hopefully he's busy right now and can't hear me talking about him. But Will, uh, I saw what happens at McAfee is when you successfully depend, defend your doctoral thesis, the school will take a picture of you alongside your committee and post it on the school's social media pages. So when I saw Will's picture, I texted him. I said, congratulations, Doc. And I asked him, I said, what was it like? What was the defense especially like? Because mine's coming in 9 to 12 months. In short, he said, it felt pretty relaxed. And Will's a pretty relaxed guy. He said, like everyone in the room, they already know how much work you've done. They already know all the stuff that you've put into it. So they ask you about things that get you excited about your project and what you'll do with it once you've gotten your degree. And then Will said, really, man, all you got to do is get through the hour and just get it over. There's no stress, nothing. You just watch the clock and hopefully in an hour it'll be over and you'll be Dr. Thomas. Just survive the hour. Just hold on until the time is up. Hang on until it's all over. Like a point guard in the final seconds of the game, just hold the ball. Don't shoot it. Don't dribble it. Just hold the ball and let the clock run out. That's all you got to do. Like the quarterback who all he's got to do is take a knee when his team is up by nine in the final seconds of the fourth quarter. Just let the clock run out. Just let the end come. Like a doctoral student who's put in all the labor to earn for him or herself that coveted degree and those three stripes on their robe sleeves, just fill the air with words until your time is up. Confessionally, that's what most of us preachers do. Just fill the words, fill the air with words until the time is up. But you know something? I I'm afraid that's what a number of us who call ourselves Christians do. I mean, seriously, uh, especially, especially when it comes to the way we think about the end, how this whole thing is going to wind up when God slams the door shut on history. We're just sort of holding on, 
kind of half holding our breath, hoping we've done enough of the right things, maybe laid off enough of the wrong things, that when the mace does fall, when the second hand comes around, when the trumpet sounds, when the hour finally comes, we'll be able to uncross our hidden fingers and fully exhale because it'll all be over. And all the bad stuff will finally go away and we'll get our reward. So all we have to do is hold on. Wait, stick it out, grit our teeth and bear it just a little bit longer. And some would say that this is the whole point of Jesus' revelation to John. That this is what it's all about. About conquering. About sticking it out to the end. Not giving in to temptation, discomfort, or persecution. Some would say that the book of Revelation is a sort of warning, a letter written uh, in order to scare us straight, to keep us focused on the future. A letter written in order to point believers' eyes upward and forward. And there's a great realization that all of this stuff is going to end anyhow. So just buckle down, because we're all going to get through this. I have to tell you, It's really not a bad way of thinking about things. I've gotten through a lot in my life with that sort of way of thinking. To focus on the future, to trust that God will eventually put an end to all that's wrong with the world. I mean, isn't that the only way it can happen anyway? There's nothing you or I can do about it. But but what if we're missing something? What if we've missed something in, in our obsession to hold our breath, to grit our teeth, to just hang in there until we get through? What if God is asking us to hang on until the end when God will show up with a sledgehammer and a sword? And what if He isn't? What if if God is already here among us, calling us to join in the redemptive work of transforming this world into God's perfect kingdom? Now I know, I know the passage we've read from Revelation is one with which a few of you might be more familiar or somewhat familiar. A passage you've probably heard more than once. And I also know that any time Revelation is in the bulletin, people get a little squirmish. People get a little squeamish. What a Revelation? Oh, what's this about? And I know it comes with all sorts of baggage. Baggage packed by preachers, Sunday school lessons, science fiction novels. Big budget cinematic thriller starring Nicolas Cage. I know. It comes with all sorts of baggage. But let's all listen to these words together again. Specifically the words spoken by the loud voice from the throne in verses 3 and 4. See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be His peoples. And God Himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. Why, it almost sounds like a benediction. As if after you read those words, you should stand up from your chair and say, Amen. It's a stirring passage. One that ought to bring us hope. Give us a sense of peace about the future. About the reality of God's coming. The tabernacle, the tent, the dwelling, the home of God is among us, among mortals. God will dwell with them and they will be God's people. I think it's a little helping verb in there that messes us up sometimes. God will dwell with mortals. I think that's when the gears start to slip a little for us. God will dwell among mortals. It's not about understanding the future. It's about understanding now. Because you see, while these words from Jesus' revelation to John seem to suggest that God hasn't yet come down to dwell among all of us mortal folks, there's some other words from Scripture. Words from the same what we call Johannine tradition. That's all the books of the Bible with the title of John in them somewhere that tell us that God's already come down among us. In the first verses of the fourth gospel, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the world, and the world came into being through Him. Yet the world did not know Him. He came to what was His own. His own people did not accept Him. But to all who received Him, who believed in His name, He gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And then the writer says this, The Word became flesh and lived among us. 
tabernacled among us, pulled his trailer in right along beside ours. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. God is already among us. Christ, Matthew says it, Emmanuel, God with us. The Holy Spirit already dwelling here with us. So what then do we make of these words from Revelation? When John the Revelator records these words spoken by the loud voice from the throne, he's bearing witness to the fact that God has indeed made God's home among mortals. That God, God's self, is already among us now. However, God's presence among us isn't meant to be some secretive, undercover surveillance job. God's not an undercover boss walking around to make sure we're doing our jobs right, earning our living. The Almighty doesn't simply hide behind the invisible veil of immortality, watching us like some weird Santa Claus, making notes about our failures and our triumphs waiting for the right time to peel back the cosmic curtain and finally reveal God's full self to us. No. God's presence among us is as real as the very air we breathe and just as mysterious. God's presence among us calls us into relationship with God, into communion with the Almighty. God's very presence among us calls us. It's a call to join with God in bringing about the fulfillment of the prophetic promises of the kingdom. Not then, but now. God's presence among us ought to inspire us to action, to take part in ending those things that bring pain and suffering and injustice upon others. God's presence among us ought to stir us to actively join in with God in wiping away the tears from the eyes of those who mourn as we faithfully set about bringing an end to the things that cause us to cry as we seek to put an end to causing one another pain. God's presence among us, along with God's words in verse 5 of the text we've read, call us to be a part of God's inbreaking kingdom now. Because it doesn't say, see, I'm going to make things new one day after it gets really bad and I just can't stand it anymore. No. God says, see... Behold, maybe that word catches you a bit more. Behold, I am making all things new. I am making all things new. The very grammar of these words points to the reality that God is actively making all things new now. That the kingdom of God is breaking into this world even now. And we, you and me, all of us who call ourselves Christians, can join with God as God's presence is among us, calling us to bring about this kingdom where all things are new. Now I think here I ought to say something, and I hope is, is, is as obvious as anything, but maybe it's not. That that we can't do this on our own. You can't do it on your own. And maybe that goes without saying as we witness a world where so many think they've got all the answers, they've got the quick fixes, the policies that'll put our state, our country, our world back on the right path, and then we just watch as they create further divisions and spawn more vitriol among folks who would otherwise get along. We can't bring God's kingdom on our own because, well, if we could, it wouldn't be God's. It'd be yours. It'd be mine. It'd be ours. It wouldn't be God's. Sure, there are a lot of folks who want to see their vision and their version of God's kingdom come. A a kingdom of folks who look, think, and act like they do. A kingdom with a gate around it, but that's not God's kingdom. However we may interpret this passage before us, one thing is certainly clear. God is among us. God is among the peoples of the earth bringing God's kingdom to reality. And God's the main source of the action, the primary protagonist in producing perfection. That doesn't mean we sit idly by and assume God's got all of it. Waiting for God to do it all so we can get what's coming to us in the end. You know, there's some words, some memories that are sort of burned into your mind, at least in the mind. Things that happen to you that maybe in the moment seem trivial, 
But as you grow older and look back, they, they all but change the trajectory of your life. Moments that sort of lay tracks down to bring you to where you are right now. There's one I always come back to, even though it seems kind of small and maybe insignificant, maybe an unimportant memory if I filed them around. But I was 13. I can't even tell you what I was wearing. It was a sort of a, a, an orangey pink colored champion t-shirt I'd cut the sleeves off of for football practice. Gray athletic shorts. It was a Friday or Saturday night. I know I was at my dad's house sitting on the end of the couch. Dad still had one of those old couches. Maybe you have one in your house with the wooden arms and the print of something like a wagon and a barrel or something on it. Came with a matching coffee table. Had weird cushions on the end for some reason. Now, I remember when I stayed at Dad's house then, I always slept on the couch. There were too many of us in the house for everybody to have a bedroom. And so I'd come in and throw my bag at the end of the couch, and I slept on the couch. I remember my stepmom got up from her chair and went outside. Dad was out in the carport replacing the intake gaskets on the ugly old 78 Cutlass Supreme they drove. It was burgundy with a white vinyl top that was peeling. And I distinctly remember Paula, my stepmom, saying, why don't you let Christopher help you? And you all should know now, you call me Christopher. Yeah, that's a non-starter. But I remember my dad replied with words that I probably can't say, but others he did. He don't want to do any of this. He won't want to help me. He's not interested in this. Now, folks, hearing that day, hearing my dad say that sparked something in me. I got up off the couch. I put my shoes on. I went outside, and I stood right next to Dad, and I said, what do you want me to do? And he looked a little stunned. What do I want you to do? He pointed at a coffee can. He put all the push rods and the hydraulic lifters, soaking them in some oil. There was a cardboard box where the gaskets were. And I spent the rest of the night handing him a wrench. What's nine sixteenths mean? What's, a, what's one half? What's a, what is this one for? What is this thing for? Asking questions about how things worked, about what this was and what that was, trying my best to, to learn and to help, because I knew it wouldn't be the last time I'd have to do this. Now, did I fix anything? No. Probably made it worse, really. Did I do anything? I didn't even turn a, a nut or a bolt. Did anything? Was my presence there helpful at all? Probably not. But taking part in it did something to me. Helping my dad do it, that changed me. That shaped me. He didn't need my help. God doesn't need our help. But it changes you. Maybe that's what God's presence among us is all about. Maybe God invites us to bring about God's new kingdom, not because God needs us or because we have to do it in order to earn a spot in it, but because our participation with God, our joining with the presence of God among us, that's the thing that's making all things new. That our cooperation with the ever-living, ever-moving, ever-loving Spirit of God in bringing about the reality of God's kingdom changes us. Even when we're too worried about changing everybody else, it changes us. Maybe God calls us off the sidelines and into the action because it shapes us, prepares us for the coming kingdom, prepares our hearts and minds for the wideness of God's grace in the kingdom when we get our hands dirty with God's work. Why in the world do you get in a bus and drive 13 hours to help people in the Rio Grande Valley? Not because it helps them. Because it changes us. Why do you get on an airplane and fly to a place where there are people who don't look like you, or talk like you, think like you? Why does it change them? No, it changes us. Why do you go into the dark corners and places where you might get hurt, where things might change, where, where God obviously isn't? Why? Because God is already there. And it changes us. Perhaps we shouldn't be simply waiting around for the hammer to fall the trumpet to sound, and the buzzer to go off, for the sky to rend open. Maybe, just maybe, God has already begun bringing about the fullness of God's kingdom as God dwells among us even now. Maybe the new is already coming down. And Christ is calling our gaze upward 
to reach our hands upward, not so that we'll lift up off this earth, but so, not so that we may long for something up there beyond the clouds, but so we may long to dwell with a God who is already living among us now, coming down now, that we may long to bring God's kingdom down to us now, so we may all live in the presence of God together, so that we may all be a part of God's making all things new. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, even now, you are making all things new. Even here in this place among us, even in our hearts and our minds, you make things new. Lord, even when we are resistant to that making and that shaping, Lord, we trust we trust that you're making not only things new, but working them out for the good of your kingdom. So Holy Spirit, as you're here among us, Lord, help us to, to recognize your presence, that making of all things new. Stir in us, stir around us, call us, Lord, to the action even now that you'd have for us, that we may begin even with our next breath to join in with you come alongside you in making all things new. Move among us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.